Hey guys, this is Stephanie Lemlin, and I play the computer, and also Artemis, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Recognized, Chris Jones, D-11. Initiate, Comic Commentary, Part 1. Hello team, welcome to Comic Commentary, Retrospective. In Comic Commentary, we've been reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. But today, we have something special for you. My name's Rich, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Emily. Hi, everybody. Today in Comic Commentary, we welcome Christopher Jones back to the show. Christopher is the artist responsible for the majority of the Young Justice tie-in comics run, as well as being an artist for DC, Marvel, Titan, Slave Labor Graphics, Image, Malibu, Caliber, and more, somehow. (laughs) So many. Uh, Christopher is currently the artist on Doctor Who, the seventh Doctor for Titan Comics. And Christopher, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. I don't even remember working for some of those publishers. I, <laughs> wow. That's the sign wow. of a successful career. Yeah. Oh, or, or just, you know, oncoming uh, old age. I don't know. Um, <laughs> one of the two. I like how Emily did what I did last time, which was take a deep breath before you started that list. You were like, <gasps> and here we go. <laughs> You know, there's parts of my brain that I still feel like I'm trying to break into this industry, and and then there's yeah. other times where I'm like, <laughs> I am an industry veteran, right? And it changes from moment to moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel that way in the RPG industry. People, <laughs> so people will come up to me at conventions and be like, "How do I break into comics?" I'm like, "When I figure it out, I will let you." Know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't know yet. Yeah. I'm not sure. Still working. How does that happen? Uh, uh, as always with comic commentary we are not having a crashing the mode segment of any kind so if for some reason you're listening to this without having read the series or listened to all of our analysis this is your official spoiler warning (laughs) so just just in case just in case i have no idea what this means this is going to be entertaining i can already tell um (laughs) so chris (laughs) <laughs> Chris, welcome back to the show. Obviously, thank you so much for coming in for this like fun retrospective. We did talk the last time that you were on the show a bit about the series, but we kind of were talking about it in some ways in some abstracts because we hadn't done something like this uh, up to that point on the show. Um, so we'll we'll get into some nitty gritty now. But before we dive into that, uh, what projects you've been working on since we last talked? It's been uh, over a year now. Yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what I was in the middle of. Last time, uh, I'm doing another Doctor Who miniseries, as Scott said in the opening. Um, I had done a uh, third Doctor uh, Doctor Who series for Titan Comics last year that was written by Paul Cornell. Uh, and that was a wonderful experience, and it was very well received. And I'm currently in the middle of a miniseries featuring the seventh Doctor, um, and that is written by Andrew Cartmel, who was the script editor for the Seventh Doctor era of the TV show. Oh, wow. So, that's amazing. Uh, so I'm having a great time working on that. And the first issue that is out now, and I'm currently finishing it up. So very shortly, I'll hopefully be on to other things. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, I, gosh. Uh, so many odds and ends in between, but I, th- I don't think that's anything anyone would have seen or heard of. So, um, yeah. Well, you, Do- you've Doctor forgotten. Who, you've forgotten Doctor companies. Who. You've forgotten companies you worked for. So. Well, no, it's it's not just that. It's that a lot of the stuff I've done in the last year has been piecemeal stuff and commissions and 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 a lot of stuff that just didn't get as it wasn't as publicly visible as a Doctor Who series is. Let's say that. Oh, right. I got you. Um, I got you. I hear what you're saying. So, gotcha. but that's what, that's what I'm up to. And you do a lot of conventions, right? Oh goodness. I, I, why do I even bother to pay rent? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I hashtag life goals. Yeah, every, every year I tell myself that I'm going to do fewer conventions. How's that working out? And that, no, it doesn't happen. 
So yeah, but usually I average like twelve to fourteen conventions a year, which wouldn't be that bad if they were evenly spaced out. If it was like a convention a month, that would be great. My May was free comic book day one weekend and then conventions the next three weekends. Wow. Um, two of which were local, one of which was out of state. <laughs> Um, so that was kind of brutal and it snuck up on me. I hadn't really planned it that way when I said yes to everything. And then when I saw that, how tightly packed they were on the calendar, I'm like, well, there's nothing I can really do about it. Right. Right. <laughs> so I, oh, my, my May is going to be interesting. And it was, but I survived it. So nice. I asked you this last time, but I'll ask you again. Are you coming to San Diego this year? Still no, not, not this year. Uh, my ongoing situation with San Diego is that it's just, it's so brutally expensive with the, the hotel situation and whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, I, with the, the number of other conventions I'm doing, it's just hard to justify uh, that, especially, especially since uh, they have like a waiting list to get into their artist alley. So not having been going, yeah. it would be hard to get in right away to start going. And then I would have to be at my table the whole weekend instead of running around doing all the stuff that I used to enjoy doing there back when I went. Yeah. So, I've, I've heard this story a lot and it's, it's unfortunate that, I mean, as much as I love San Diego comic-con, it, it's definitely at a point where it's, that's, it, it, that's a sad story when it's that big yeah. and a comic artist can't get in. I basically. keep me, I keep meaning to get out to like WonderCon or something else. Just right. So right. Have another, another, uh, appearance out there because i get to um the gallifrey one convention in los angeles every year but like that's my only regular california uh convention appearance right now and it's not a comics convention and it's not san diego it's los angeles so right i realize for people that would love to see me at san diego it's not the same thing so yeah now i hear you WonderCon's yeah. good though so let's uh, well, I've, I've never been, been, but I I've hear been good about it. I've been to WonderCon once, and I've been to a place. Uh, I don't even know if it's still around. ApeCon, the Alternative Press Expo. Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've heard of that and haven't been to that either. And I, I believe the weekend we're recording this is Heroes Con, which is another one that I hear rave things about and haven't gotten to because um, for the last twenty years, uh, June has been dominated for me by the run up to. Uh, Convergence, which is a convention that happens right. here in Minnesota that I helped start. And have I've usually been involved enough in working on that that I don't do a lot else in June. Yeah. So that's made it hard to get to Heroes Con. Although I'm I'm less busy in the ramp up to Convergence now than I used to be. So Heroes Con might happen sometime in the near future. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, well, well, let's dive into our, our topics of choice. Uh, Emily and I both have uh, some questions, and you had uh, you mentioned that you have you've heard some of the things that we've talked about. <laughs> Why, yes. <laughs> uh oh. We always forget people like listen to us. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I've been listening. Yeah. <laughs> you said uh, before we started recording, you said something about. Um, you were regularly screaming at the radio at us or something like well, that? No, no, not, not screaming, <laughs> not screaming. It's, it's, it's difficult to listen to conversations about things you were involved with and people speculating about things. And I'm like, I would, if this were interactive, I would have things to say, but it's pre-recorded and I, that's not how the universe <laughs> works. The laws of causality appear to still be in effect and i cannot participate <laughs> so well that's why we brought you onto the show we figured you may have you. an observation or two oh yeah maybe a couple uh so one of the things that i was actually interested in asking about is something that we touched on briefly in our comic reviews and you heard apparently if you listened to us and shouted us was um that with how with some of the comics the like initially finished art what we thought was going to be the finished art actually ended up being changed before it was published and we talked a little bit about some of the ones that you've talked about online like the uh barbara and dick grayson kiss in the closet with all of the names changed on all of the board games and uh the page that involved marie logan's death and how that all went down uh, so I was wondering if you could maybe go into that a little bit and like the process of how these changes happened or the stories behind them or 
how that works. It's not like there's some big Young Justice censorship scandal or anything like that. It's, it's a typical part. <laughs> I didn't think so. No, but... no, no. It's a typical part of the process of, of creating uh, comics, uh, especially when you're working on big franchise properties for a publisher, that stuff will get uh, changed at the 11th hour. Uh, and very often those changes come late in the process. The way it was explained to me was, especially th- things that, that uh, the possible objection comes from like st- the standards and practices people, rather than just the preference of the editor or something like that, is that every time you show it to them, they're getting another bite at the apple. You know, they, they can they can come up with something else they object to sometimes just because they feel like, you know, I have to show that I'm doing my job. So here's a note. Um, right. So the preference is show it to them as few times as possible, which means you show it to them very late in the game. And so sometimes something that, you know, you might have been caught at the script stage. It's like, well, they haven't seen it yet, so they're not going to see it until it's drawn. <laughs> um uh, so, I mean, Easter eggs, I mean, like, I don't understand the nature of the, uh, objection to the, the, the closet that, yeah, on, the, on the, the, yeah. the closet full of board games for anyone that hasn't heard the story already. It was supposed to be a closet full of board games. And like, I knew I couldn't have it be actual like Parker brothers. <laughs> right. And whatnot. Yeah. So right. I thought it, a fun thing to do, knowing, knowing that it was our last issue of the comic, I thought mm-hmm. a nice little, you know, wave at at young justice fandom would be to use all of the uh ship names that had been kind of codified by tumblr as the as the name the names of these these games so i created logos that were all based on things like you know super martian and and things like that in a surprising number of them actually make great sounding uh names for for games but um you know i that they for some reason asked me to change and i don't know why but you know it's their prerogative whatever and i eventually got to share the original artwork and and so i think you know a lot of fans at least know that existed but i mean there were other there were other things and like like i said this is all pretty standard stuff working for any major publisher uh the uh the captain adam storyline the whole the whole murder mystery thing that we did with captain adam um a big part of his origin you know, the, part of what was getting retold in, in that Young Justice context was that Nath- Captain Nathaniel Adam had been framed for murder. And the way he had been framed was that someone was stabbed in the chest with Captain Nathaniel Adam's personal uh, knife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the artwork was done. And it got shown to standards and practices, and they said, this is an all-ages book. You can't show a knife sticking out of somebody's chest. Yeah, yeah. And I had drawn it in the most bloodless way possible. There's no visible (laughs) wound. There's no blood coming from it. Like, literally, there's just a hilt of a knife sticking out from somebody's chest, and the Mm -hmm. guy could just as easily have been awake looking down and saying, well, that wasn't there this morning. Um, (laughs) So... You know, I thought it was fairly tame, but they said, you know, no, that has to go. And and we're kind of like, it's the focal point of the entire plot. <laughs> uh, like, wow. it, you, yeah. you would have to reinvent the entire story. So the way we had to do it is I redrew the figure, the, the dead man in the chair, turned away from the camera. So the other characters in the scene were reacting to the knife and i forget whether i forget whether they had to make any change to the dialogue to clarify what it was the other characters were seeing but the point is like it it now wasn't visible in the artwork which Uh, is pretty funny to us because i don't know how many times we said in these comic reviews everybody dies yeah there's that was so a... much death in these comics that was a surprisingly common phrase for an all ages book well the thing you have to remember and i i don't I, I feel like compared to a lot of modern superhero comics you know we we weren't the most edgy <laughs> book out no, there no. but, no, but by all be. ages title terms the, the thing you have to understand is nobody creatively working on the book had any interest in it being an all ages book. We just <laughs> no. wanted to tell 
comic <laughs> to match right. the show. Right. Which yeah. was not I mean, I think I think the show is done in a way that it's acceptable for kids, but it's certainly written to a sophisticated, mature audience. Right. Um, I mean, it's it. American entertainment does not seem to understand the concept of all ages. They hear that and they think, "Oh, it's for kids." Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Star Wars is all ages. Right. You know, yeah. as a big Doctor Who fan. Uh, there was a time when Doctor Who was being made, as well as two spinoff shows, Torchwood and the Sarah Jane Adventures. Right. And that was the yeah. perfect illustration for me of, okay, these are all taking place in a shared universe. You've got the adults only show, you've got the all ages show, and you've got the kids show. And, you know, if you watch each of them, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Got, gotcha. As As someone who watched Torchwood not realizing that it was an intentionally adult show like you figure that out in the first 15 minutes <laughs> I'm like oh okay never mind yeah um so you know but dc decided that since the young justice tie-in series was based on an animated tv show it had to be branded as an all ages book and then once they branded it that way then they wanted it to fit within the very conservative restrictions of what DC is comfortable doing in an all ages book, which mm -hmm. always frustrated us because none of us wanted the label on the book in the first place. Right. Um, although, although more than any restriction on the content, our biggest frustration with that was that uh, it meant that the book did not get categorized with the other superhero titles that dc comics was doing it was grouped with looney tunes and scooby-doo so that was true whether you were talking about like the solicitations of what dc had coming out or how it was displayed on the shelf at most comic shops and retail locations so during the run of the book i would frequently be at conventions and people would would stop by my table because they'd see Young Justice art on my banner and be all excited because they loved Young Justice. And it was news to them that a comic book tie-in existed. Yeah. Even if they I, were comics fans that were at their shop every Wednesday looking for new books because they'd never seen it. Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure, I think I've said this in the past and I just want to make sure that I'm totally right, but I'm pretty sure I didn't even know what was happening while the show was ha was going on. And I didn't find out the comics has existed until maybe... I don't even know, six months, a year after the last episode when I was digging around on the internet and somebody was like, hey, there are these comics. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll check them out. But they're probably just, Yeah, and as you know. guys have covered in your podcast, I mean, the comics had stories that were a lot more meaningful and relevant than tie-in media usually, usually is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, the, the, the show was definitely written in a way that by no means did you even need to know the comics existed to appreciate the show, but the comics were being produced by, you know, Greg and, and were based on stuff that Greg and Brandon had come up with in their world building and, and their, their building of the, of a timeline for young justice. So, you know, there was stuff that was appearing in the comics that was very significant. It's just, they had never found, space in their finite number of episodes they were producing to fit it in so they did it as a comic book story right yeah yeah and it, i mean we we did this we talked about this you know in, in your last interview this idea that this just this whole concept that it was so tightly woven in with the series was is pretty revolutionary i, I think it's genius yeah but um they're in rereading them like i hadn't reread them right before you and i talked last time Diving into them, as I learned when we were reviewing even the episodes that I thought I knew, like the back of my hand, I would be watching them with a different eye. And I'm reading these with a different eye, looking at things in the background and, you know, those kinds of things. And even and Emily catching things that I didn't notice, you know, and vice versa. But one of those things was you were just talking about was the um, the one scene it's got Bruce and Tim and they're in Two Faces Lair. Yes. <laughs> And you were right before we started recording, you started to tell us the story and I told you to save it for the podcast and tell us the story behind that. <laughs> oh, well, there's there is a one panel scene that takes place that 
Batman and Robin are meant to be having a conversation, and Greg decided that rather than have them just, you know, crouching on a rooftop next to gargoyles as they spend most of their time, instead, like, let's make it look like they were in the middle of working on a case. So I'm I'm sure a lot of the thought was, whose layer can they be in that it's obvious from how the layer is decorated what villain this is so you understand what they're doing because they're not going to talk in the dialogue about where they are or what they're doing at all they're talking about something else but just from the context of where they're standing you kind of understand that you've caught them in this moment where they're they're working on a case so it ends up being two-faced and and the script didn't describe in a great amount of detail what all was supposed to be there so you know, I kind of went to town on having one side of the room as uh, clean and Spartan and modern um, as I could make it. And the other side had, you know, torture devices and looked like a medieval dungeon and just was dark. And, and I can, cons- I considered framing the shot symmetrically right. so that, you know, you had a line right down the middle with, you know, one side of two faces personality you know, on the right and the, 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 the quote unquote good side on the left. Uh, and I thought, well, everyone's done that shot. Let's make it a little less obvious by seeing it from an angle and just seeing who picks up on it. Emily and not me. That's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I heard you guys talking about, you know, there, there's even a bust and I don't, I wasn't trying to, I don't think I was trying to make it specifically um, a bust that had been seen in another story or anything like that. There's just, a, there's a certain style of bust you see, you see Shakespeare, you see Beethoven, you know, it's, it's just that, that certain style of head and a bit of shoulder kind of bust. And it's been hacked away at on one side. And I'm, I'm imagining that, you know, Two-Face found it somewhere and personalized it. But I, I don't think Greg did this to torture me, but <laughs> Greg knows that uh, it was a great frustration of mine coming out of my previous ongoing series, DC Comics, which was uh, the Batman Strikes. I, I am a huge Batman fan. I got to draw a ton of Batman stories, which pleased me greatly. But I never got to draw three of my favorite villains in that book because that was the tie-in to the Batman. And like the show, that series wasn't allowed to use three villains that at the time there was an embargo because of the Christopher Nolan movies. And I never understood the logic behind it, but that was, that was the case. So there, there was no use of Rachel Ghoul, Two-Face or Scarecrow, who are three of my favorites. Right. So I finally got to draw a Rachel Ghoul story thanks to Young Justice. Um, but I still have not properly gotten to draw in a story. Um, Two Face or or the Scarecrow. I drew the Scarecrow in one panel of something once, which I don't even really count. Um, in, so in the I've now drawn, no. Uh, no, no, no. Um, oh. an- another thing I had done for DC years before um, a uh, a Secret Society of Supervillains ten pager that appeared in one of their secret Silver Age secret files kind of anthologies. I forget which particular one it was, but they, they, DC was doing a lot of those big 80 page anthology books for a while. And it was in one of those, but um, uh, so I've now drawn two faces layer in a comic, but I still haven't <laughs> actually gotten to draw two face. So close. So, so thanks close. Craig. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's the story of, of that panel. And I have um, equally engaging stories about every other panel from this series. Excellent. <laughs> Let's start with uh, first issue. <laughs> yeah, page one, panel one. Okay, right, so, exactly. Um, Let's see, wait, wait. When did so you started interior art around issue five? Yeah, yeah. The the two parter okay. that has them all uh, going on the camping trip and telling secret origin stories oh, uh, was so the good. first one uh, I drew. Okay, I have questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, Emily, I know, though, had a little bit more to the question she started to ask earlier, and I want to hear more about that. So you about the Marie Logan thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Would you do you want to share that story? 
because I vaguely know this story from hearing it uh, at conventions and you briefly talking about it online on Tumblr. I but, hadn't heard this story until Emily told it to me. About the art being changed or what? Yes, yeah, about like thing. there was something about Queen Bee and yeah, Marie so Logan. and it, It's referenced on the show that Queen Bee had been responsible for the death of Marie Logan. But we actually see that moment in one of the last issues of the, the comic series. And basically... Queen Bee uses her mind control powers on Marie Logan to make her uh, drive her truck off a cliff. And it's it's kind of a chilling um, scene to see, and it's meant to be. Kind of? Um, Is the qualifier yeah. you're putting in there? Well, I, okay. no, I'm just saying... Traumatizing, you, you, heartbreaking. Bad things yeah. happen to characters in comics, but there there is something about the coldness of... Uh -huh. Just telling her to drive off this cliff to her death, and I tried it's, to. It's the moment when she says, "Okay, now I'm crying." It's the moment <laughs> that she says that Garfield's waiting for her, and this is the yeah. fastest way to get to him. I almost threw the book across the room. <laughs> yeah, I was like, "I excuse me." And Rich, you were reading this as an adult. I read that for the first time when I was like fourteen, maybe fifteen. Yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> I'm reading it as an adult, and then in rereading it this time, I'm reading it as a dad, and I'm rereading it after having like that whole like 30 second scene with Garfield at the waterfall on Rand, like playing in my head. Oh my god! Anyway, sorry to derail you, Christopher. We just no, needed no, you to know fine. how you punched I, us I, in the feelings. I apologize we have for emotional scars. So Never apologize. The, the, orig the original version of that scene uh, had Queen Bee kissing Marie Logan to use her mind control powers on her. That is how Queen Bee's mind control powers have been shown to work in the past. Uh, they have been described as uh, affecting most men and some women. Yep. So, you know, figure it out. Um, <laughs> There's and, a lot of that kind of subtlety throughout the whole book, actually, and I want to dive into that yeah. too a little bit. But, but finish well, and, and a lot of it, a lot of that again is, uh, and I, th I think it's true of both the show and the comic that Greg and and Brandon Vietti knew the stories they wanted to tell, and they knew that there were certain limits on what they could get away with, so they found ways of walking right up to the line and then implying the step over the line yep. where they wanted to go, but. The in this case, you know, when I got the script, I knew that this was kind of pushing the limit uh, of what they were going to let us get away with, not just in a comic book, but in an all ages book, because people get weirdly touchy about about ideas of what you can portray as far as uh, human sexuality, not sexual acts, but human sexuality in all ages material. So I don't even draw, I didn't even draw them kissing in the original version. I drew them about to kiss. Mm. The lips are touching. The, the kiss was implied. Uh -huh. And I was hoping that was good enough. Right. And again, it got shown to the standards and practices people and they objected. And it was the first they'd, they'd seen it because one bite at the apple. And so they, they were like, no, no you can't have them kiss. Well, uh, what uh, Greg came up with, and I completely agreed with it, was that um, he, he, well, first of all, he borrowed from one of his old shows. He, uh, he, you know, Greg, for anyone who somehow doesn't know, Greg was also the creator of Disney's Gargoyles. And they had a code on there. Um, the, 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 um, the Gargoyles equivalent of kissing was this kind of hair stroking gesture. So Greg borrowed from that and has Queen Bee leaning in close and just stroking Marie Logan's hair. And you get the sense of intimacy between them, but you don't get the impression as much that they kiss. Okay, fine. But what Greg did that I completely applaud and was happy to draw it was there was another scene in the same book where Queen Bee uses her mind control powers on a male character. Yeah. And that they'd had no objection to. And Greg said, well, if we're changing one, we're changing both. Yeah. yeah. Because the intent of the other scene 
was to clarify how queen bee's powers work and so you know the idea is like no no it needs to be the same yep we aren't going to we aren't going to change one but not the other so that's that's what we did is we changed to both and i ended up giving the when i made the changes to the artwork i i did that as a, a patch and composited it together rather than altering the physical original artwork of the of the page and so i took the original version that has that almost kiss and uh gave that as a gift to greg um upon the the end of the run of the comic book as a way of saying thank you for inviting me along on the ride oh so he's got hanging in his office oh that's awesome love it okay so many questions (laughs) well also some comments uh just to just the whole idea where it's like okay we mentioned before there's a lot of dying in these comments (laughs) Um, nope. it's handled really well. Everything about it is there, but handled really well. The, the realization that, that Greg and you, uh, managed to slip in Rocket's son, Amistad, <laughs> who in the com in the original comics, uh, was an out of wedlock birth. Well, in- I mean, that's, that's Greg. That's, I mean, <laughs> anything know, I, that is, I hear what you're uh, saying. I mean, like that, I can't claim it. I appreciate that. The whole idea that that went into the comic and it took yeah. me a while to realize the timing implied something that was not directly addressed, but is still clearly there. Like how the, the idea of being able to story tell that way to be able to present things like that is, is impressive to me and got past these things where like, okay, we're okay with, Robin and McGann investigating a woman who was murdered or someone, a, a chain of people who get killed because <laughs> Robin is investigating something. They're all just dying left and right in explosions. But this kiss is a problem. Yeah. You know, those, you know, those uh, Star Trek encyclopedias where they will have like, here's the entire chronology of the history of the universe, according to Star Trek. Okay, yeah. They could publish a book like that with the Young Justice chronology. Because yes. I, I know yes. that Greg and Brandon have a document. Yes. That is you know the chronology yeah. of Young Justice. And I am, I've never gotten to see it. I am terrified a little bit of its <laughs> existence. I imagine it, this Lovecraftian <laughs> tone. <laughs> The the Justice Namacon? Yes, yes. <laughs> with with Wally's face on the cover. Um right. It's with the lightning bolt because he painted yeah, it on there. Exactly. Yeah. No. Totally on brand. Souvenir. <laughs> if you if you if you chant it around an open fire, all the characters just come to life and terrorize the world. Exactly. But yeah, I mean it's part of it's part of the style of storytelling Greg likes to do, it's part of the advantage of having this elaborately defined chronology that, that, you know, plays by the rules. I mean, you know, the, when, when time elapses, characters get older and, and, you know, the, the, there, there is a day by day consistent chronology to all this stuff. And it means that if you set a, a story at a certain time, and you have Greg's sensibilities as a writer, you can drop in these little references that it just sounds like small talk. It sounds like somebody talking about what's going on in their life, but the things they're saying are all these like continuity references that, you know, you can, Mm -hmm. you can go down the the rabbit hole of exploring that stuff. And it's just, it, it, it gives and gives and gives. Yeah. You might want to start a podcast about it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Maybe. Maybe, Someone maybe. should do that. I know, right? Right? I'd listen to it. I was honestly shocked that there wasn't one already. <laughs> <laughs> I was when it came up. When it came up on Twitter, people were like, "Rich, you should do this thing," and I was like, "That's somebody's done that. <laughs> somebody's done that." And then I went. And I looked, and I was, there was not. There was a few like mentions on a few podcasts, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And now it's you. Apparently. <laughs> My life, our life yep. is weird, Chris. Our life is weird. You. Yeah, it's uh, super I, weird. I know that feeling. <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> on a complete aside, I posted a photo this morning for my birthday. Yeah, it's a picture of me uh, on Twitter. I think it's on Twitter. It might be on my Facebook too. 
Uh, it's a picture of me with a Superman cake. I think I'm like eight years old. And I was just like, oh, this reminds me of Chris's story about having the Superman outfit on on your on your website. When yeah, you were like 10. which is so funny because like as a kid, I mean, I liked Superman just fun, but I was yeah. much more of a Batman kid. <laughs> but I too. don't have that photo. Right. I have a Batman costume, but I don't have that photo. Right. So I, I mean, what I've got is. Yeah. <laughs> I like Super Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. I was reading at the time because my brother was getting it, and so I, yeah, I like Superman too. But I think it was just my parents were like superheroes. Let's get a cake, <laughs> you know, and that was it, you know. But I, but they didn't know that I was into Robin and Batman. Yeah, it was just funny. Anyway, by the way, I keep I keep uh, teasing Greg that I'm gonna like make up fake Young Justice spoilers and put them out into the ether. And he's like, no, don't. People will think you're serious. And I'm like, okay, I won't, I won't. But Please the, my, don't do that. My, it's my, not good. No, but my, <laughs> my standard, it's so over the top that hopefully it will be really obvious that I'm kidding. Line is, uh, yeah, if Young Justice ever gets to season six, that's going to be, the, with the time skips, that'll be Legion of Superheroes. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I want Legion so bad I can taste it. Oh no, kidding! I mean, it's like, it's even appropriate for Young Justice, right? Because it's like Absolutely. young heroes and like, oh yeah, no, I would be all over that. Oh my god! So they already used Rimbor, and uh, anyway, I'm rehashing some old stuff. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it. yeah. Okay. Anyway, yeah. back to the meanwhile, back to the show. <laughs> meanwhile, back on Whelmed. Uh, uh, <laughs> Emily, did you have more stuff? Well, I just want to, this is just a, this is a comment, more of a comment than a question. And it plays into how our lives are weird. Super weird. Because I'm living proof that Young Justice was a gateway into DC and comics in general for people. Because, Chris, you drew the first comics I ever bought <laughs> in my life. I uh, now feel so old. Right? Uh, <laughs> Welcome well, to I the can, show. Well, it, it, to me, this doesn't even feel like it was that long ago. I mean, I feel like well, it was just a few years. Well, I didn't, I, I didn't get into comics until I was a preteen teenager. So it's not like I was like an eight-year-old buying well, my no, first I, I get that, but no, that's uh, that's flattering. And I'm, I'm part of my existence now at conventions is because people will see the Young Justice stuff. And and they'll be like, oh wow, you worked on Young Justice. And like, if I don't say it right out of the gate, they're they're gonna go down the path of thinking I worked on the show. And so I say as clarification, I didn't work on the show. I drew the comic. And it always I always worry that it sounds like I'm sounding apologetic for like only having done the comic. I'm like, right. no, no, I'm no. damn proud of that comic. Yes. I'm very damn proud of that comic. It's just yeah. it's this thing that people people assume otherwise if i don't get that out there <laughs> and i just i don't want to i don't want to be like five minutes into the conversation i suddenly realize oh they're thinking i did something totally not what i did right yeah like no. like the like the time i was talking to somebody at my table at a convention and i overheard a I, i'm assuming father who was standing behind his young son with his hands on his shoulders and he leaned in close looking at me and said you see that guy there he created the teen titans <laughs> i'm like congratulations oh, god Chris. i'm gonna have to tell marv wolfman about this now um it's like it's just it's just wrong on so many levels it, i know and i'm like do i go out of my way to say excuse me um your dad doesn't know what he's talking about right it's like oh, it was god. just this little, i was like okay if they walk up and talk to me i'll try to steer them towards correct information and then they never did they walked away so i don't uh life at conventions it's fun and surreal and strange um so I, in relation to this question about like or this idea of changing things and yeah talking about like the the you know, scarecrow and two-face being off limits and and you know that kind of stuff from your other comic run what's the story about icon and rocket because yeah. We found out the YJ Wiki guys got a hold of us and and clarified from what we said in the show that the scene where Rocket's in it that was the last issue they were allowed to use Rocket or that you were allowed to use Rocket or Icon and then from that point on you weren't allowed to so they kept referring them to them as the 
cooperative contingent and some other stuff. Do you know what, what's the story behind I don't that? know the full story. Uh, <laughs> what I know is this. Um, so, you know, DC does not own the Milestone characters outright. They have a licensing agreement with, with uh, Milestone. And I don't know what the nature was of the issue they were having at the time, but we were, we were in the middle of working on, I think it was the very next issue after the one with rocket. Right. And, uh, we were told you can't, you can't use the milestone characters anymore. Uh, they're, they're, they're off limits until further notice. And we're like, Oh, and that was too bad because uh, Rocket was going to be part of the group that was dealing with the force field dome over Metropolis. Right. And yeah. Icon was one of the characters that had been grabbed by Killstar and was up on the moon. Yeah, and seems appropriate. Yeah. Spaceship. And they just suddenly had to go away. And I had actually drawn an issue full of panels where icon was standing around with Superman and captain Adam and all those other characters up there. And I had to alter the artwork to take him out. And then just going forward, it was, it was a matter of, of rewriting to not include them in the, the story. Um, the messiest thing about it was I, I actually, when we got told we couldn't use them until further notice, it was actually me that pointed out to, our editor at DC that this, the, the solicitation for a future issue had already gone out that showed icon on the cover oh, in those right. crystal oh. cell things that, that Killstar had. Um, yeah. And, you know, anyone that was paying attention was going to notice when the book came out that right. suddenly he's not there anymore and something <laughs> right. happened. And like yeah. there just there wasn't anything that we could do about it, um, and I wasn't the one that had to make the, the alterations on that cover because that was actually one of the few covers that I didn't do. Um, but I, you know, he he was like I said originally in the um, in the interior story that you know that I had already been drawn for. Um, I guess it would have been part two of players, um, so issue twenty one. Uh, and, you know, I had to remove him from that, and then they just were absent from the rest of the storyline, even though roles had been planned for them. See, I don't, I don't know what, what the um, underlying issue was between DC and Milestone, but it was, it was a legal contractual thing that gotcha. just suddenly, like, oh nope, they're they're not available. Take them out. No, that's a bummer. Yeah, um, but again, it's 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 part of the reality of this franchise stuff. I mean, right. you know, people. Yeah. People come up to me at conventions and and you know ask if the the comic is coming back now that the uh, the show is being revived and and I'm like well we'd we'd love to we're waiting to hear from DC and they're like you should do a Kickstarter or you should just you know it, they, they yeah, suggest well, some no, kind of proactive thing that we could do that you know I have to explain to them it's like we don't own it the industry doesn't work that way you know it's just uh, there's not really anything for us to do other than regularly remind DC that we'd really, really love to be doing it and hoping that that's something they decide to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Where Emily and I are both sad and pausing in sadness. <laughs> well, I mean, it could still happen. It's just the, yeah. it's, it's frustrating that they passed on the opportunity that, build into things. that we, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Cause what, what Greg and I, tried to do was sell them on um, reviving the comic as soon as they had announced that season three was greenlit. Right. So given that, I mean, so one of the, one of the realities about the original tie-in comics run is the lead time on animation is so much longer than comics that the stories for season two we're already in various stages of development by the time I ever started drawing the book, which is one of the reasons why the comic could be so prescient in dropping hints at things to come is those stories were already in the works. They knew what was coming on the show, even into season two. Mm -hmm. um, so with the show, you know, with the show coming back, you know, we could have had, 
the it, you know when we could have had a, a new issue a new version of the comic out in time for San Diego Comic Con last year. <sighs> And we could have had the comic coming out all this time leading up to the point where season three is going to launch. Right. Narratively. Yeah. And, uh. and that, you know, and Greg could have been kind of treading water with our progress towards that point until we knew what the exact date of that premiere was going to be. And then make sure that like, okay, now we're going to catch up with that moment so that you know we we get there when when the show comes out it would have been beautiful it would have been been amazing yeah and and, and dc never said no they just were were sort of like we'll think about that that's an interesting idea and it just it hasn't happened so Mm -hmm. they could still you know it, it it's very very possible that like once the show is actually out they'll be like oh hey we should do that tie-in comic that you guys have been talking about (laughs) And and at that you know believe me we would still be delighted to do it. It's sure. just it seems like a missed opportunity that for this year when there's been buzz about the show returning, but no content out there for fans to consume. Yeah. Um. And no announcements about anything really. Like that's been it's been frustrating. Yeah. Well, the, the part of part of why the the wait has seemed so long is that usually when they are announcing a new animated TV show coming out, they don't announce it until it's close to ready. You know, they've got promo Mm -hmm. art, they've got, you know, a trailer, they've got stuff to hype it. And then it it comes out soon. Well, with young justice, because there had been all this clamor to revive the show, they, made the decision that they were going to pull the trigger on it and make, make that third season. They announced that publicly. And then literally the following day hired Greg and Brandon to start working on it. Right. So welcome to the 18 month production cycle of a season (laughs) of animation. Right. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I get that. We've talked about that a bit on the show, trying to help people like, make the weight more yeah, understandable. No, I, yeah, I understand but the like, frustration. But, but like, but, but the announcements of things like, if you're going to say you're doing a streaming service yeah. and then you, you're you announcing now that you have four or five original shows coming on and like a bunch of other stuff, like right. there hasn't even been stuff about the streaming. There's been very little about <laughs> production notes for any of no, these shows. And obviously that's and, not on the oh Young Justice. God. No, no, of course, absolutely. That's but it's just on like, whoever's in charge of right. plans if, for the streaming service. If they, if they could have, um, I, I, I guess my point is, is that it would have fed into the purchasing of these Young Justice comics and yeah. built something that people could talk about instead of everyone just talking about how nothing's happening. Yeah. <laughs> across the board not just with young justice but with any of the stuff like we still don't even know we assume it's going to be subscription service but we don't know for sure and is it is it not like what's yeah and i think think part of the problem is that all the people that would be deciding that stuff and deciding when and how to announce that stuff Mm -hmm. are not the people that are making the decisions about whether to do a comic book or no of course i mean it's it's you know it's it's this big multi-headed hydra of a corporation mm-hmm. and i say multi-headed hydra in the kindest way right <laughs> that that you know but but it's 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 a big company that that it, you know the left hand doesn't always know what the right hand is doing and it's right. not as coordinated as from the fan perspective when you're like mm-hmm. it's young justice i just want to know what's going on with young justice right um I mean, you we're know. definitely we're definitely all like armchair CEOing, you know, yeah. at this yeah. point. And you know, I intellectually I get that, but I'm just like, guys, I, it's, you're right. When you say it's something like, you know, these are some these are some pretty big missed opportunities, yeah. um, and you have a fan base that's really rabid, and so we that <laughs> fan base really <laughs> built up. I say that being rabid. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, especially since- we built up all this inertia to get the season three and then, OK, well, we got it. So we don't have to really do anything anymore. Yeah. We're just now getting the show. But then so it's like everybody got really riled up and really excited about it. And then 
We have five years of energy that has built up and all we want to do is throw our money at DC Comics and they won't let us. And, and part, yeah. of, part of my frustration with it too is that since one of our big problems the first time around, as I said, was a lot of fans didn't even know the comic existed. Right. Yeah. Having the comic be the one place to get original content before oh. the show premieres. Through the roof, man. That the, the word would have gotten around, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and, and, you know, so again, uh, not that Greg and I wouldn't be thrilled to do the comic again, um, regardless of the timing, because even, you know, even with the show coming back, you're still, you know, there's always going to be a finite number of episodes. There's always going to be more stories to tell. And the comic would be better suited to stories that look backwards. I mean, not that you can't do a flashback or something in the show, but there's something about the nature of the show that I think the the narrative just needs to continue to drive forward. Yeah. And the comic is well suited, I think, to to cater to to hardcore fans and be like, let's find out what the story was behind this in the show's history. So yeah, we want to do it. Not to mention that when we when we when the comic ended before, one of the very next stories we were going to do is one that to this day just kills me that we didn't get to do, which was we were going to introduce the rest of the Marvel family. Right. Yeah. Which Ooh. I really wanted to do that in the worst way. Sorry, I just had another realization. Yeah. Because Emily and I talked about another story arc that seemed to be nodded to in the comics that didn't get done either. Yeah. yeah. Emily. We we noticed a couple of hints that it seemed like you guys were building up to a story about Zatanna and Dr. Fate. And we wanted that so bad. And I continue to believe that I would just throw my money at DC Comics if they ever did this. <laughs> I don't know that there were uh, plans to specifically cover that in the comics. I would keep watching the show. Okay. Okay. We'll, uh, we're both <laughs> well, like interesting. In well, no, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying I, I sure that there are plans to drive that story forward along with a lot of other yeah. things that have been left hanging. Um, of I, I don't given, given that I, I didn't talk to Greg about that back in the day. Yeah, and, right. and, and there are not currently any hard and fast plans about new comics as much as we are chomping at the bit to do them. You know, I, any, any plans to, to do more with that currently are in the, in the sphere of the, the show. Gotcha. Totally. Makes perfect sense. Um, <laughs> no, but we're definitely excited about that. So yes. I'm still wondering if it's even Dr. Fate, uh, even Z Z Zatara in season two. It may not even be Zatar. No. Oh, it probably is. I'm just messing Rich. with Emily. Every, every time you bring it up, I'm like, I no, I, I can't. I couldn't handle it. It I would know. be too much change. We all know how Ms. Martian cutting her hair affected my emotions. <laughs> that would be too much. So here's my question about Miss Martian and her hair. Oh no! Oh, excellent. I asked a question. Look out, here comes that bus. Throw him right Given that that's right under. not her natural form, it's an expression of her shape-shifting ability. Uh -huh. Did she get her hair cut, or did she just suck a lot of it back into her head? <laughs> it, she just sucked it into her head, man. You yeah. know that. Yeah, that yeah. probably that second one, unless yeah. she was having a very dramatic day. So I just, I kind of want to see that moment of just, you know, where it yeah. goes back in. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Conclude part one, part two, T minus seven days. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. 
Thanks for listening and stay whelmed.